Hi there, I want to welcome you to the broadcast today. I'm going to be talking about the material for a miracle. You know, God works the miracles, but many times He requires us to supply the material that the miracle happens uh, with. We, we need to cooperate with God. And you may be in, in dire circumstances right now, and you just might find some, some clues, some keys that will help you on your journey. So uh, grab a Bible if you've got one. Let's get into the Word of God together today. It is going to help you. John 6 and 5, Then Jesus lifted up his eyes, seeing a great multitude coming toward him. He said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread that these may eat? But this he said to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, Two hundred denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them, that every one of them may have a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There's a lad here who has five barley loaves and two small fish, but what are they among so many? And Jesus said, Make the people sit down. And there was much grass in the place. So the men sat down in number about 5,000. And Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to the disciples, the disciples to those sitting down, and likewise of the fish, as much as they wanted. So when they were filled, he said to his disciples, Gather up the fragments that remain, that nothing is lost. Therefore they gathered, gathered them up and filled 12 baskets with a fragment of the five barley loaves, which were left over by those who had eaten. Then those men, when they had seen the sign that Jesus did, said, This is truly the prophet who is to come into the world. Now, uh, we began by reading that Jesus lifted up his eyes and he saw this great multitude coming to him. But if you read in the other Gospels, it tells us not just that, that he saw them, but it tells us how he saw them. In Mark's Gospel, it says he saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion for them because they were like sheep not having a shepherd. Jesus cares for people. He is compassionate toward people. This miracle was rooted in his compassion. And I want you to know that today he sees your deepest need. He is not unaware of the situations you're embroiled in, the things you're struggling with. And his great heart is yearning over you. He wants to help you. He is our faithful and compassionate high priest who's the same yesterday, today, and forever. As you know, his grace and compassion stand out even more as you study the other Gospels and get the background of this great event. You see, Jesus was tired. The disciples were tired. The scripture said that there were so many coming and going that they didn't even have time to eat. And on top of that, Jesus has just received the news that John the Baptist, his cousin, has been murdered. It wasn't just a matter, you know, hey, you know, John's been killed, but the manner in which it happened is just despicable. Herod in a, a you know, state of, of drunken lust as his stepdaughter begins to dance before him, this sen sensuous dance. He says, I'll give you half of my kingdom. And she says, I don't want that. Just give me John the Baptist's head on a plate. And so he sends to have him beheaded and in front of a whole, you know, big banquet hall full of people, they display John's severed head. And news of that comes to Jesus. And you need to understand that John knew more of Christ's ministry and understood more about Jesus, the Son of God, than any living human being. He had insight from God that no one else knew. And Jesus would have acutely felt that loss, not only because it's his cousin, not only because of the, the heinous nature of, of the crime that was committed against him, but the one person who understood his calling and ministry has now been killed. And so he says to the disciples, let's go to a deserted place and rest for a while. And they get in a boat and they go. But the multitudes hear about where they're going. And on foot, they travel for miles. And when Jesus and the disciples get there, they lift up their eyes and here come the people. So instead of getting a much needed rest, there's going to be more ministry. And you know what Jesus doesn't do? He doesn't say, what's wrong with you people? Can't you give me one day? No, he wasn't displeased. He wasn't upset. He wasn't put out. He was moved with compassion toward them. He met their needs and he ministered to them. Wonderful Jesus. And 
In this deserted place, a great need arose. They had nothing to eat. The people had traveled a long way. And there's no food for them. And Jesus asks Philip a question that is going to test Philip. It's going to reveal where Philip is spiritually. And it's going to reveal his general outlook on life. But before we look at his response, I want you to notice again verse 6. Speaking of Jesus, but he said this to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. Tells us a couple of things. Number one, God doesn't always tell you everything he knows or what he plans to do in a particular situation, though I wish he would. Sometimes he lets what's in us rise to the surface, and you know pressure tends to do that. Not because he needs to know what's in us, but we need to know what's in us. And so he puts Philip to the test. Hey, where are we going to buy bread to feed all these people? The Lord already knew what he's going to do. But he doesn't always tell us what he's going to do. And Philip's response to the question was not a response of faith. In fact, that's why later on, one reason why later on, Jesus asked him, have I been so long with you and yet have you not known me, Philip? question the Lord asked him in the same gospel a little later. And secondly, it tells us that even though you don't know what he's going to do, he does. Nothing ever takes him by surprise. Your present dilemma has not caught God off guard. He always has a plan. Even when our troubles are self-inflicted, he always makes a way of escape. In his mercy and his compassion and grace, he always has a plan for us. He always has a way for us to go. It's never like, man, I didn't see that coming. You know, Gabriel, you got any ideas? I'm stumped on this one. I've never seen anybody in this much trouble. This is bad. Uh, he's never, ever taken by surprise. And I wish we'd learn to rest in that and just roll our anxieties on him. Just touch your neighbor say, God has a plan. Now, when this great need arose, we could say it was responded to with two schools of thought. And pretty much everybody in here today is going to be in one of these two different schools. There's Philip and there's Andrew. Two different outlooks. Now, when Jesus asked the question to Philip, he immediately begins to calculate and reason and lean on his own understanding. And so many people do that, whether it's about, you know, the, the cost of bringing the, the bread of life to the dying masses of the world or dealing with your own personal family needs in your own immediate future. But some people immediately begin to get out the calculator and focus on the difficulties, never once bringing God into the equation, never once bringing, you know, his power and his promises into the equation. And they work everything out and say, all right, you know, uh, 200 denarii, it just, it, it just can't be done. You know, Philip's response, 200 denarii is not, not enough to do this. That, that, a denarii was the equivalent to a man's daily wage. It had the purchasing power of a, a, a daily wage. And so Philip works out right away that two-thirds of a year's wage is not enough to even make a dent in the need. Philip was a pessimist. He had not yet made Jesus his source. And I know a lot of us, we say, you know, the Lord's my source, but I wonder if we really believe it. Remember one day, Janet and I were having um, a meal with Oral and Evelyn Roberts, and I, I don't know why he did it, but Oral, you know, wheels around and just sort of fixed me with that laser stare, and he said, Bayless, you just remember this. God alone is your source. No man is your source. God alone. And, you know, I, I believe that and, and, of course, had heard that, but I don't know if it was the way he looked at me or the way he grabbed my lapel. I'm not sure. <laughs> but it just struck me to the marrow. God is my source. I want you to know he's your source today. Your company's not your source. Your job is not your source. Your union's not the, your source. Your family's not your source. God alone <laughs> is your source. And, you know, Philip could have said, Lord, I was there at Cana when there was that embarrassed couple that ran out of wine at the wedding, and I saw what you did. You turned 160 gallons of water into wine. I'm sure you can do something for this hungry crowd. But that was not his response. 
I can see Philip just beginning to form a committee. Okay, guys, come around. Now the Lord's, you know, asked me how are we going to feed this crowd, but I've already worked out that two-thirds of a year's salary is not enough to even give each one of them a bite. Anyone have any suggestions? One guy lifts his hand and says, yes, yes. He says, well, you know, I, I agree. This is ridiculous. First, we don't have this kind of money. We, we just need to send them to their homes. It can't be done. Philip would turn around and say, all right, Mr. Scribe, write that down. Not enough money. Okay. Anybody else have anything to say? Somebody else lifts a hand. Yes. He says, well, I just want you to know for the record, I agree with the financial part and with no disrespect to the Lord. You know, has he forgotten we're out in a wilderness area? Has anyone noticed there's no bakeries here? So even if we have the money, where are we going to get the bread? There's no place to buy it from. Philip says, excellent observation. Mr. Scribe, write that down. No bakeries. Anybody else have anything to say? Third guy, well, yeah? He says, yes. He says, well, uh, you know, I was just thinking that even if we did walk into a village and even if there was some, you know, mega bakery that, that you know, could make bread, what bakery could make enough bread for this many people? I mean, there's 5,000 men. There must be at least another 5,000 women and children. So even if we, we took the journey and found a village with a bakery that was open, no bakery could even make that much bread. Philip says, I was thinking just the same thing myself. Mr. Scribe, write it down. He begins to write it down. Calculating, thinking, going over and over, looking at it from a human perspective. And Philip might have said, you know, even if there was a bakery that could sell us enough bread, and even if we did have the money, we don't have the manpower to feed this many people. Do you realize how many people it would take to feed a crowd this big? We just don't have the resources. It can't be done. And about that time, Andrew pipes up. And Andrew surveyed the same situation, and he found what they did have. And rather than center on what they didn't have, he brought the little that they did have and gave it to Jesus. Now, his faith wasn't perfect. He almost seems to chuckle at his suggestion. You know, I mean, we got this kid here. He's got five barley loaves and a couple of small fish. And in the Greek language, both the lad and the fish are quite small. Andrew was an optimist. He was a possibility thinker. Now, now barley, it was the, the poor man's bread. It was really coarse, and only the poorest of the poor ate it. So there's these little bitty loaves of bread and a couple of sardines. It's not much. But when he put it in the hands of Jesus, the little became much. And when you put your little in God's hands, little does become much. Now, instead of being like Philip, concentrating on and talking about and pointing out what you don't have, look at what you do have. What are you doing in your situation? You see, Philip put the material for a miracle into the hands of Jesus. I remember reading a story years ago about a Korean church. Today it is the biggest church on planet Earth. It was back in the early days and they were struggling in a building program and didn't have the, the, the funds and the pastor and his wife had given sacrificially and they just, there was no way that it could be done. And he talked about how depressed he was. And in one of the services, an old woman stood up. She was very poor. And she held up a, a chipped porcelain bowl. And she said, this bowl is the only thing I have to eat out of it. And I have one spoon that I use to eat out of it. It was a porcelain spoon. She said, I'd be willing to give this. I can eat out of cardboard and I can use my fingers. I'd give this for the church. A businessman on the other side of the building stood up and says, I'll give $10,000 right now for that bowl. And a chain reaction started, and they were able to build the entire building and get it done. But it all went back to one old woman that offered some loaves and fishes. God worked a miracle out of a chipped porcelain bowl. It's amazing what God can do if you'll put what little you have in his hands. I read another story, true story, here in the U.S., building program going on, and, uh, you know, the, the children's pastor had, you know, tried to get the kids engaged, and one of the little girls in children's church painted a picture 
you know, watercolors and said, Mommy, I, I want to sell this to you so I can have money for the, the, the building project. And her mama said, how much does it cost, baby? She said, a dollar. And so mama gave her a dollar and, and, you know, brought the picture and told it. And word got out. And a man in the church paid $50,000 for that little girl's water, watercolor picture to go towards the building fund. Literally, God built a church out of a little watercolor picture. Loaves, fishes. Janet and I went to a church years ago and uh, went to an early morning prayer meeting. And I thought it was funny. There was an old cowboy boot sitting on the step, you know, on, on the, the way up to the platform. And I found out what it was there for. A cowboy started coming to the church and he called the pastor outside one day. He says, I got something for you, pastor. And with a bunch of, you know, gear in the back of his truck, he pulls out this old ratty cowboy boot. He says, you know, I've been looking for a church that, to get planted in and I feel like this is my home. And every week when I get paid, I stick my tithe in the boot. Here, I've been saving it. So he gives him this boot and the pastor thought it was really funny and told the church, you know, he gave me his tithe in this boot and everybody had a laugh. He set it on the stage and people came up and started putting money, unsolicited, to start putting money in the boot. And you know what? They raised over a million dollars through the boot. <laughs> Amazing. They built a building out of a cowboy boot. Do you remember when Moses is there before the burning bush in the desert and God says, Moses, you need to go to Pharaoh. Bring my people out of the land of Egypt. And Moses says, God, you know, what, what if nobody believes me? I mean, what if nobody listens? And God asks him a question. He says, what's in your hand? Moses said, a rod. And he gives it to God. And you read and see if it's not so. From that point on in the scriptures, it's no longer referred to as the rod of Moses. From that point on, it's referred to as the rod of God. And God used that stick to deliver Israel out of the land of Egypt. That's what all the miracles and the signs and wonders were performed with in the land of Egypt. That's what was used to divide the waters of the Red Sea. I'm telling you, if all you have is a boot or a stick, if you put it in God's hands, it's enough. God can multiply it. I had a lady come to me years ago. I was, at the, in fact, it was in our little uh, kind of storefront thing here on Catella. I was praying one afternoon, nothing's going on, there's no, you know, services happening and there's no building programs going on, anything else. And I knew the lady, I'd prayed with her, talked to her some, and I knew she's going through a rough patch and struggling a bit. And there, I hear a knock on the, the auditorium door and I answer the door, I say, hi, come on in. And she's got this like a little knit beanie and she puts it in my hands. I said, what's this? And I'll never forget, she looked in my eyes, says, Pastor, this is my loaves and fishes. I'm bringing it to God's house. And she turned around and left. And I suddenly realized that I was holding something very sacred in my hands. I was holding the material for a miracle. She understood something from the scriptures. And I just want to encourage you, you know, whatever you have, little or much, give your talent to God. Give your singing voice to God. Give, give your, you know, your, your ability to think and solve problems to God. Give your resources to God. Put your little in the hands of God. Give it to him. Even if you say, look, I've just got barley loaf ability. It's enough. You look at this auditorium and this building. This is just multiplied barley loaves. That's all it is. I've had people on occasion tell me, said, man, it must be amazing to, to pastor Cottonwood. It is. What a privilege. But you know what? I just gave God my barley loaves, truly. Spent endless hours on the street passing out tracks and talking to anybody that would stand still long enough. Three times a week, you know, in rest homes, I took my guitar and learned all the old songs, bringing in the sheaves and in the garden, and I walked the hallways and played to all the old folks in the retirement home. And I'd go in their rooms, some of them abandoned by their families, and I'd read them the Bible stories and hold their hands, tears streaming down their faces as I'd pray and lead them to Christ. And then we'd sing the old hymns together. Every single week I'm in there doing that, doing home Bible studies, doing other things. I just gave my barley loaves to God. And it wasn't a lot, granted. And I think if God looks at us and sees a people that says, God, we don't have a lot, but here's our willing hearts. We've got our Bibles. We've got a few dollars. We're going to put what we have in your hands. The Lord is smiling because he knows what he's going to do. We need to put the material for a miracle in his hand. Jesus worked the miracle, but again, Andrew had to bring him that which the miracle was wrought from. 
And the Lord is still in the business of working miracles and doing amazing things. Somebody say amen. amen. Oh, yeah. Unfortunately, you have a lot of people in the church that think more like Philip than like Andrew. It's like, you know, television, that's so expensive. You can't do that. I know millions can be reached, but the cost. And do you know how much this rally is going to cost us to do that? Do you have any idea? Buying a piece of property in this economy, that's crazy. 200 denarii worth is not enough to make a dent in that. God's looking for possibility thinkers. He's looking for people from the school of Andrew rather than from the school of Philip. And here's just a few thoughts that I think are important as I try and bring this to a close. You know, the disciples were out there at the Lord's bidding. He had said to them, come aside by yourselves and rest a while. And they had nothing to eat themselves. I mean, Andrew had to bring the little boys lunch. That means not just the multitude. That means the disciples themselves are in a deserted place and they have got no resources. They have no food. But when you're where God wants you to be, he will meet your needs. Even if he has to use a dirty-faced kid on a skateboard to do it. God always has someone. He had that little boy. How amazing was that? How unexpected was that? But the Lord knew what he was going to do. Now, whether it's the kid with a skateboard or somebody in an Armani suit, God always has somebody that can be there to meet the need. Somebody that can open a door that you cannot open yourself. Somebody that can give you an introduction that you could never get yourself. Someone to connect you where you could never get connected on your own. Someone to share a bit of wisdom with you that you need to take the next step in your journey with God. Someone that can give and meet the need. God always has someone. Yeah, he does. And you know what? I think it's better to be that someone than to be the someone in need. And it's good at both ends. I mean, it's, it's awesome to be the recipient of blessings, but Jesus said it's more blessed to give than to receive. And I think it would please the heart of God if we said, God, help me be that person to meet someone's need today. Direct me today. Help me to be the answer to someone's prayer. You know, we had Paul Chase speaking here on a Sunday night a few weeks back. He's got a great ministry in the Philippines, and he shared a story with me that I had never heard before. Paul Chase and, and Jeff and Patsy Perry are, are friends. Now, Jeff is on our board and is a longtime friend. And uh, they, they were in Bible school together. This is 30, however many years ago. It's way back. And uh, Jeff and Patsy were your typical starving Bible school students. You know, they're working, but uh, not making a, a big wage. And they had gotten to a place where they were getting paid at the end of the week, but they had run out of funds. They didn't have a dollar. So no money to buy food for that week, no money to get any gas in the car. And that morning they prayed, said, God, we need help. And they worked it out and said, God, we just ask you for $20. $20 will get us through the week. We can get enough for gas and, and enough to get food for the week, and we get paid at the end of the week. Well, that morning, Paul Chase is praying, and God laid on his heart to put $20 in an envelope and seal the envelope and go to school. And there's like 2,000 students in the school. They didn't know each other at all. So Paul's there, all these students are in a big auditorium, and he sees Jeff, Jeff and Patsy, and he feels directed, and he walks over to him. He says, I have something for you. He says, it's not much, but this is from God. Jeff opens it, and there's $20. He and his wife have just prayed right before they, they came to school that morning for $20. Now, how amazing is that on the receiving end? I mean, that speaks volumes to the heart. God, you, you know about the little things. You're going to take care of me as I go into the future. You hear my prayers. You are real. I mean, ju just the, the, the payload of that to the heart is enormous. But I think on the other side, even more blessed. You know, Paul said, God, you, you've led me. I, I, I know how to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit. This is amazing, that this joy that, that I, I can participate with you in a miracle and an answered prayer. It's fantastic. And, and, you know, it's, it's, it's good on both ends. Man, I've been on both ends lots of times. But I like the, the side where I get to be the one that I'm God's errand boy. Or you can be God's errand girl. It's just, just, ah, I love it. Be the vessel God uses. And then, you know, in this story, it, it said that everyone ate as much as they wanted. And there was leftovers. God is a God of fullness. He is a God of over the top. 
He does exceedingly abundantly all that we can ask or think according to the Scriptures. Jesus said, I came that you might have life and have it more abundant. That's the kind of God we serve. But the, the counterbalance to that is Jesus said, all right, gather up the fragments that nothing be lost. He's also a God of stewardship. He's not wasteful. He is a God that, that gives more than enough, but he doesn't give us room to waste. And so they gathered up the baskets, and I love it. There's 12 baskets, 12 disciples. You know, the implication is pretty clear. And you think about, you know, back to how this started. They are tired. They are hungry. But they have had to lay aside their own needs and their own wants, and they've had to pour out and minister to others. And there are seasons in life when you have to lay aside your own desires, lay aside your own needs, and be used by God to minister to other people in need. But there's always a reward. God will always reward you for that. And they laid that aside, but God took care of them. And he will take care of you. And then finally, it says, when the people saw the sign which the Lord had done, we read that in verse 14, they knew that this was the prophet that was to come into the world. And my prayer is that if I, as I give myself and what I have to God, and as you give yourself and what you have to God, as we put our little or much in his hands, that a lost and dying world is going to realize who Jesus Christ is that he is the Son of God who came not to condemn the world, but that through him the world might be saved. What a Savior he is. Well, I hope that you got something out of that message. And you know, the last point is we spoke about stewardship and, and doing our part to help the gospel get out. I just want you to consider it. You know, life is short, eternity is long, heaven is real, and hell is hot. And, and we just don't have time to not be concerned and not be engaged with kingdom things. And if you haven't been supporting gospel work on a consistent basis, why not consider helping us? We, I, I don't get anything at all personally from doing this, you know, other than the joy of taking souls to heaven with us. But we are reaching over a, well over 100 nations of the world with the gospel via television every single week. And uh, there are people that partner together with us and that, that, that sow into what we're doing financially and pray for us. And it enables us to take these messages around the world. I'd love for you to become a partner with us. I know God would bless you if you would. So why don't you prayerfully consider it. And uh, until next time, I pray that God would richly bless you. We'll see you then. Bayless Conley here. I would like to invite you to some meetings I'm going to be doing in Europe. First, we will be in the Netherlands, and after that, we'll be in a couple of cities in Germany. He is not like other American ministers. He doesn't pretend, you know, he takes you in and he's very real. It's practical and it's clearly explained. I would love to meet you. Come out to the meetings. We're going to be sharing the Word of God, and I'm going to be hanging around to greet people. I hope to see you in October.